governor of the Central Bank, Sajid Nimar Kamral, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Mr. Articular, <coughs> uh, Vice President, uh, Chairman of the Tax Faculty, uh, CEO, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a good afternoon for all of you all. Uh, <coughs> today, I think, as uh, Arun mentioned, uh, for 60 years we have conducted this post budget evaluation or analysis of the budget, and today we, uh, the Institute is doing this. As you know, many of our members uh, are in, in the tax sort of profession, so they will find it useful from our panel who will uh, indicate some of the direction as well as some clarification on some of the budget proposals. We have also an eminent panel which is there with different industries who will probably give their insights as to the uh, how these proposals might impact those industries. So, <clears throat> so this is a uh, so unfortunately we we are unable to have this physically. I know many people would like to have it physically, but unfortunately the current situation doesn't permit us to do so. Uh, without taking too much of uh, uh, time, uh, we will go through this budget proposal. I think I have mentioned some of the other things. I think all of us generally tend to focus a lot on the revenue proposal, but there are also uh, other proposals in the budget which I think shows the direction the government is moving and uh, certain initiatives the government is taking. So these also can create opportunities for the business community as well. Uh, those also need to be looked at for only focus mainly on uh, revenue proposal. We will also have a situation where clarity can be sought. Uh, there will be certain areas, there are certain areas which have certain doubts as well. Uh, but I'm sure the panelists, uh, the governor, especially the governor and secretary will be clear. I also finally just want to thank Mr. Uh, Sabral for coming here, the governor of Central Bank. He is one of our past presidents. Uh, so he, for him, it should be like come home. I hope it is so. Uh, and uh, I'm sure all our members will appreciate sir, you were addressing them uh, as chartered accountant as well and uh, the governor of the uh, centre bank. With that, uh, let me not take too much of time and uh, we get on with the proceedings. Thank you very much. Secretary to the Treasury, the President of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Mr. Manir Jaisinger, the Vice President, Mr. Bandar, for inviting me in this house to share a few thoughts about the impact, as Arun rightly mentioned, of the budget on the economy. I believe all of us are conscious that every budget, every action of the government, even actions of outside agencies, can have an impact on an economy. Very often, in the last few months, we have been talking about the impact of the COVID pandemic on the economy. Not only the economy of Sri Lanka, but the economies of the world, and how it has changed the way in which governments, economies, and everyone else has been functioning over the last nearly 24 months. I think it's essential that we take stock of what these challenges are if we are to assess what impact it has and as to how we are going to deal with these tensions that emanate from various situations. When we are thinking about the way in which outside situations impact the economy, what comes into mind is the challenges that Sri Lanka is facing today. We see that there is a sluggishness in growth. We see that we have some tensions in our external account. We see that there is a concern about the debt of the country. We see that there are also concerns with regard to the forex situation. Now, in all these matters, there is constant review 
by people consciously or unconsciously about what's taking shape in the country and in the economy. So in that context, let us examine some of these issues. Firstly, the need to have stability. As you all know, the main concern of a country is to ensure that there is stability as far as the economy is concerned. Stability is not easy to define, but st stability is easy for you to feel. When there is no stability, you realize that there is no stability. If you were to examine today's context, you will find that there are certain areas of operations that give various anxieties to the different stakeholders. Now, in the case of stability, you find that the Central Bank of Sri Lanka is entrusted with the economic stability as well as financial system stability. Now, in that context, there are certain measures that we have to take in order to deal with the debt situation as well as to deal with the situation with regard to the forex inflows and outflows. At the same time, the government has to deliver growth, has to deliver poverty alleviation, has to ensure that there is equitable, equitable delivery of the resources of the country so that the country can be looking forward to a faster growth, equitable growth, as well as ensuring that the country can move forward with clarity. That is why you would have seen every country delivering a broad horizon of its activities in the form of a government policy document. And at the same time, every country presenting a budget, which is the basis on which the country will move forward in the next one year or so. Now that is what the finance minister has done. Every year, as all finance ministers do, this finance minister also has presented a budget to you, which is under very challenging circumstances. Now these challenging circumstances are twofold. One is the global challenge, the other one is the local challenge. As a result of COVID, we have seen several areas where there have been some serious weaknesses that have developed in the country as well as in the external economy. That needs to be addressed. The revenue shortfall as a result of businesses being in a contracting mode as well as the difficulty of harnessing these revenues. At the same time, as a result of certain measures that the government had great to take with regard to the COVID situation, the pandemic situation, the government has also been put under some pressure in delivering the resources that are needed for growth. So this twin problem has caused a serious burden to the finance minister. But at the same time, if you look at the way that the government has responded, you would find that it has ensured that consistency is maintained on a basis that people can take comfort that they have their main thrust of development activities have not been disturbed as a result of what the finance minister and the budget has done. Now that I think is a very important ingredient in the budget making, which has been sometimes not addressed sufficiently. Today, we can meet even in a limited fashion and still have a conversation of this nature, have a discussion of this nature, because we have been able to have the vaccination program, which have been extremely well carried out so that we can, we can ensure that Sri Lanka can today enjoy the fruits of that development much easier. Now that has not been easy to do. Procurement of vaccines, delivering of the vaccine, purchasing the vaccine, all have been 
tremendously challenging in the context of the global scenario. But that has been done. But what a lot of people don't realize sometimes is that these have not come free. It has come to the people free. People have got it free. But as far as the government is concerned, there has been a massive investment to ensure that that is done in order to see that conditions become normal. Last year, Sri Lanka had a negative growth of around 3.5%. And this year, we are expecting a 5% growth, which is quite satisfactory. But next year, if we can get the growth to rise to above 5%, possibly 6%, I think Sri Lanka would have done well, and it would be well on its path to recovery. So today, the growth that is needed for the country in order to get back into the recovery mode has been fashioned by the budget, and I believe that would be an important ingredient in going forward with a continuous growth that Sri Lanka would have to enjoy if we are to actually address the poverty that has to be now eradicated. So, government has also invested a large sum of money on health, on the need for water for all. As you know, water distribution in the country is about 42 to 43 percent only, as it is. So now that has to be increased to around 80 percent. So there is a public investment that will generate a large number of activities over the next four to five years to ensure that that goal is uh, realized. And at the same time, the 100,000 uh, kilometers of road program is another very ambitious program, which will also need a large amount of investment, which would be also carried out in the next three to four years. <coughs> in the meantime, we are also looking at several other new areas of investment, particularly the Colombo Port City Commission and its activities. As you know, today when you look out of the, uh, from my central bank vantage point window, I see a large amount of work carrying, being carried out in the port city. Now, the fruits of that, the economic benefits of that will be felt in the next few years. But at the same time, the laws have to be put in place the situation has to be such that people will come back and invest regularly. And that's a large uh, project that the government is today examining carefully and supporting carefully in order to nurture the growth into the future. At the central bank also, we have our work cut out. There are many challenges that we are facing, particularly in the forex area. That's why certain new regulations have been brought. And those regulations are not unfair or in any way only brought in in Sri Lanka. Sometimes some people have attempted to suggest that these are peculiar to Sri Lanka, but these laws, rules have been in place in India, in Bangladesh, in the Philippines, in Thailand for nearly a decade. And those have served those countries well. Now, those are being brought into Sri Lanka as well in order to ensure that there is stability, that there is sufficient amount of resources being turned around, particularly in the forex market, to ensure that everyone has sufficient forex as well as there is sufficient forex for the purposes of settling loans, which will be around for the country and for the future progress. We are trying to also shift the debt situation into more local debt than foreign debt. There was a period of time during which there was a large accumulation of foreign debt which has made our country vulnerable, particularly in the period April 2018 to June 2019, there was a vast amount of foreign debt in the form of international sovereign bonds that were issued, 6.9 billion of such debt, which has today provided us with some destabilizing effects. So now these need to be dealt with. We cannot run away from these. If you are dealing with these issues, we got to ensure that we take sustainable decisions to go forward with. Now, the sustainable decisions that we have looked at are non-debt inflows. 
so that the foreign, ex foreign, ex foreign ex exchange that will come in will not be creating new debt for the country, but it would be providing uh, non-debt inflow. At the same time, new instruments, for example, government to government loans, central bank to central bank swap arrangements, as well as the securitization of various asset flows as well as inflows that will then enable the country to look at a situation which is a lot more sustainable. So that's the way forward. That's the way that we are now attempting to bring in a 6% growth. And in that context, I believe the new tax laws would be supportive of that. They have not been an additional burden on companies as well as on people because we are conscious that there is a fair degree of difficulties that people are also facing, mainly because there has been a huge increase in the prices uh, all over the world. We have seen the commodity prices as well as energy prices rising to levels which have been quite phenomenal. And in that context, it is necessary for us to ensure that we keep the, uh, the entire framework steady whilst moving forward in the new normal that we are facing. So my dear friends, particularly the chartered accountants, I believe you are familiar with the manner in which uh, the economies need to be structured as well as taken forward in order to ensure that we see st stability as well as growth. And if there is stability and growth, I'm sure the accountants will have a large amount of work that is uh, available to them as well, and I wish them well because it's my own profession as well. So in that context, I hope that these deliberations will provide you with sufficient knowledge as well as the, uh, the ability to advise your clients so that they will be encouraged to come into Sri Lanka and to also invest in Sri Lanka. So I wish your conference all success and I'm sure uh, Mr. Articula who will follow uh, will be able to give you a very clear understanding of the budget itself and the provisions of the budget and the meaning of some of those uh, policy measures that have been taken. And at the same time, I'm sure the other panel members who are also here will be able to dissect those uh, different uh, uh, policy measures in order to ensure that the accountants get a much greater in-depth knowledge of those as well. So I wish your conference and your seminar all success and I thank you very much for inviting me this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Governor Mr. Kabwal, Secretary of the Treasury Mr. Saga Tigala, President CA Sri Lanka Mr. Manil Jayasinghe, Vice President Mr. Sanjay Bandara, and the distinguished panelists as well as my chairperson CA Tax Faculty. Firstly, I hope I'm visible to all of you all, uh, given my uh, gracious height, I think I can see the mic more than I can see you all, but as long as you all can see me and the slides, that's good enough. Uh, so today I will actually be taking you all through uh, some of the um, highlights, so to speak, of the budget. Uh, there may be a little bit for every one of us and uh, we'll take it at a macro level first. So the government, whoever knew, uh, as the governor mentioned, is uh, poised to go over the past, over the next year. And uh, we've done a year on year comparison. This is directly from the budget speech and uh, the, in, uh, the in, uh, incremental revenue is estimated to be 50% from taxation. And non tax revenue, of course, of taxation, the highest revenue contribution is expected to come from income taxation, which is at 68%. GST, or rather taxes on goods and services, will be another increment of 59%, whereas non-tax revenue will grow by 33% as per the plan. And with so much of... Uh, what shall I say, anticipation, will end up with 87% of the government revenue coming from taxation. And the purpose of my uh, presentation is to show you how the revenue proposals are going to be met uh, over the next couple of years. 
tax proposals in a nutshell. Basically, if you take the tax proposals this year, there wasn't too much, but the good, the good of that is also uh, quite manifest in the budget. The government expects the tax collection to double by 2027 from 9% of GDP to 18% of GDP. Interestingly, there was a lot of speculation in this budget as to whether you know, the rates will, come, uh, will be increased, if the bases will be increased, if the pressures will go away, and if you know, things like PAYE and WHT will be reintroduced. But the government has stuck to its word, and as mentioned in the last budget, there has been policy consistency maintained in the case of all of the taxes and the concessions that were granted in the past year. Of course, there were a few new uh, introductions and a few uh, strengthening of tax administration that was introduced in the budget. So in a very, uh, at a very nutshell, there were one-off taxes that were introduced, such as the surcharge tax and a temporary hike in Vatan Financial Services. There was a new tax called uh, the Social Security Contribution, which is a top-line based tax, and special GST, again, something that was uh, actually there from the previous budget, a composite tax, which will be effective from next year. Tax administration and digitization will be strengthened to uh, increase the efficiency and collection of this uh, ambitious target that is uh, set out in the budget 2022. Um, broadly, when you look at the new revenue proposals, this is strictly just the new net revenue proposals, you'll notice that much of the revenue uh, from taxation will uh, come from two taxes, which is social security contribution and the surcharge tax, which collectively account for roughly 72% of the new revenue proposals that were announced in the budget. The special GST is anticipated to win 50 billion, while the temporary hike in FinVAT will bring in roughly about 4% of the uh, new revenue from the budget. The non-tax revenue will bring in about 7% of the total income. So what are these new taxes? How is it going to be levied? Who's going to get impacted? Let's, let's analyze them, distill them, and, and iron out any concerns that we have on them as well. So who is liable to the surcharge tax? Any individual or a company who had a taxable income of two billion or more for the year of assessment 2021. So 2021 is technically the returns that will be filed this month. By the 30th of September, you would have finalized and paid all your taxes. So you have an idea as to who you are. And um, while you do, I actually have a little bit of uh, clarity on what the base of this taxation is. We'll come to that. But for the purpose of the presentation, I'm going to assume that it is 25% of the taxable income. Um, the reason why uh, that there is a little bit of a concern there is because the term surcharge is being used and uh, surcharge back in the day meant a percentage of the tax payable. But uh, in the budget, it says that it would be on anyone who makes over 25% of taxable income. Uh, the payment date is not set out in the budget and uh, the key uh, cl clarifications that we have would be of course on the base itself which I think we will be able to clarify uh, at the discussions later, whether this uh, amount would be deductible for your income tax workings into the future, and of course, in the case of group companies, would there be an instance of an economic double taxation? Because you will have company A, which is a subsidiary of company B, which may have uh, reached the two billion, and which have distributed that as dividends to company, to the parent company, and the parent would also have, as a result, a taxable income of two billion. Uh, in that instance, uh, what, uh, uh, how is that going to be looked at, or if everyone will be liable, is something else that we need to discuss. 
So the closest analysis I have for the surcharge tax, not, not something on all fours, but the most similar was the super gain tax, which was uh, introduced a couple of years ago, where the base year was 2013-14. Again, what was liable uh, was uh, the 25% of the taxable income. I'm assuming that is right. And it was uh, the chargeability was earlier on any person or company who earned more than two billion of post-tax profits, or rather pre-tax profits, as per the audited accounts in that year. And in the case of groups of companies, the aggregate was, uh, if the aggregate was in excess of two billion, then uh, the liability was, uh, did stem to the relevant entity. But in this case, it would be on the taxable income, which is greater than two billion. Of course, there is a, huge disconnect between PBT and taxable income because there are various reliefs you can claim, various deductions that uh, come into the base and that is something that uh, we'll need to look into. When it comes to payment, the super gain was um, payable in three equal installments and given the uh, numbers that will be going into the surcharge tax, uh, we anticipate that that will hopefully be a staggered payment as well. We'll uh, have to uh, look into that into more greater detail. The next new uh, tax was the super, sorry, the special goods and services tax. Now this is not really a new introduction. It came in budget 2021, and the, the special GST is a composite tax that uh, when the budget was uh, spell out, spelled out last year, it was going to be a composite tax to replace the multiple taxes on alcohol, cigarettes, vehicles, telecommunication, betting and gaming. Now, while the rate of the tax is not known, we know that it will be effective from the 1st of January 2022. Uh, some of the clarifications there is whether the new super, uh, sorry, special uh, goods and services tax would only apply to the sectors that were originally proposed, or, um, and I believe that would be the case. Who would be the administrative authority on the special GST? And what would happen to the revenue uh, revisions that were made to the excise rates in this budget? Because there, were, uh, there was an upward rate revision on excise duties. Would that uh, be absorbed by the special GST going forward is uh, also something that I believe is, uh, is going to take place. So a quick snapshot of the current tax structure on the proposed sectors. Uh, liquor has a VAT and excess duty, so does cigarettes. Telecom has VAT, um, the telecommunication levy, and the CES. Betting and gaming uh, also has a betting and gaming levy, the VAT and the levy on gross collection, while motor vehicles, if they do come under Chapter 87 of the HS Code, it would come, it will have one composite tax called the excise duty. Now the spe special GST is to replace all of these multiple taxes, which is actually a welcome move because it means that there's going to be simplification and more certainty about what the rate is as opposed to you know, having to study multiple taxes before you make your payment. The other new tax uh, is the social security contribution. So what we do know of the social security contribution is that uh, any person who has a liable turnover of more than 120 million per annum would be liable to the social security contribution at 2.5% from um, basically the next year of assessment. That would be the 1st of April, 2022. Now questions here. Very, the closest comparison to me is, is NBT. Would it be uh, a similar basis? Would it, the liable, liable turnover mean the same thing? And uh, in the past, when uh, there were such taxes that were introduced on the top line, we noticed that some sectors were actually granted concessions because of their importance or because of other reasons. Uh, there were exemptions and exclusions. And with, would there be exemptions and exclusions for certain sectors from the social security contribution is another uh, thing that we'll probably have to get clarified once the law comes into place. So, and um, 
that's all, that's on the new taxes. On the existing taxes, we have an, a general uh, a, a, rather an exemption from general VAT for the importation or supply of medical equipment, machinery, accessories, hospital furniture, drugs, and chemicals. This is not for everyone, but it is to those who donate these to government hospitals or the Ministry of Health for the purpose of addressing the pandemic. So you need to satisfy the criteria of actually getting it approved by the Minister of Finance upon the recommendation of the Minister of Health. And uh, once you're good to go, you can get this exemption. Right on financial services, uh, remained largely unaffected in the course of many tax reforms that happened in 2019. The FINVAT rate remained at 15%. Uh, the rate is going to be temporarily increased to 18% for uh, the year 2022. And uh, the budget was very categoric that this burden cannot be passed on or charged from the customers. On um, tax administration, there were quite a few uh, areas of administration from both the inland revenue, the excise, as well as the customs to uh, de digitize, to modernize, and to make life easier for everyone. Uh, I'll start off with the Department of Inland Revenue. We all know the government invested heavily in, in RAMIS, and uh, the budget pledges to implement the RAMIS more fully and more expeditiously. Uh, online tax payments were already introduced in uh, the past couple of uh, months, and the online platform under the budget will apply, will, will, uh, ex will be extended to all banks and financial institutions through Lanka Clear, and uh, that would basically facilitate uh, quick and uh, seamless paperless tax payments uh, to the Department of Indian Revenue. There will also be a mechanism to examine the accuracy of tax documents and to present digital invoices and documents as valid documents where possible. Again, a very welcome move towards digitization and going green as a country. The budget also mentioned that there would be a, a new statutory provisions that will be introduced to use digital identification numbers and uh, also to apply tech, uh, technological processes towards tax administration to ensure greater compliance and collection. Uh, well, we all know about the 80-20 uh, rule, and even for the government, it is the same. The 80% uh, of the tax is collected from 20% of the taxpayers, and uh, the large taxpayers unit are uh, staggered throughout the inland revenue. The budget uh, pr pr proposes to actually consolidate all of the LTUs under one consolidated unit at the uh, Department of Inland Revenue. In the case of the Sri Lanka Customs, there have been quite a few uh, proposals there as well. One is to have more clarity and certainty on the HS code systems. The HS code uh, this will be updated to avoid any deficiencies that may cause in charging customs duties. Uh, the most welcome move is the single window system, which uh, will be established to facilitate the import-export processes by integrating all institutions that work with the Sri Lanka customs into one system. And uh, there were a few others on grading. The grading of exporters uh, will happen in, uh, in a manner that uh, those with higher gradings will uh, be afforded uh, free customs facilities uh, as well. And on clearing, again, this uh, so happens that the licensing mechanism currently is, uh, needs some level of simplification. And the budget pledges to uh, do that as well. Uh, subject to uh, certain HS codes, which are uh, pertaining to liquor, cigarettes, motor vehicles, and domestically agricultural products. The rest of it will have uh, certain simplified customs and CIS duties. And once you've got uh, the relevant clearances from your standard institutions and quarantine authorities, you'll be able to get your customs clearances easily. So these are the progressive moves towards uh, easing the um, administration at the Sri Lanka customs. Few more. 
On other levies, I mentioned this earlier, uh, the excise duty on cigarettes, which is imposed under the excise duty special provisions uh, act, and the uh, excise duty on liquor, which is uh, levied under the excise ordinance, have been revised upwards. Uh, the impact of uh, the is uh, the super GST or special GST, I keep saying super. Uh, this uh, special GST on this, I uh, believe, uh, will hopefully absorb all of these into uh, the GST after the 1st of January 2022. On excise 2, there's digitization that has been proposed. So uh, digital revenue systems will be implemented even for the excise department to make sure that there will be more efficiency and simplification of obtaining the excise licensing process. Motor vehicles, this is something I'm personally very happy about. Um, if you meet with an accident, then you're going to have a charge imposed on you. Uh, we'll hopefully uh, reduce all the reckless driving that we see on the roads, but the good thing is that it says that it can be indemnified by the insurer. So now it's more to do with you and your insurer, how you're going to sort matters out, but the policy is a good thing. It is to act as a deterrent for the large number of motor vehicle accidents that are currently taking place in the country. Uh, vehicles that are subject to modification, alteration, or refurbishment, again, there will be a fee that will be levied on these. The charges are not mentioned just yet, but we will hopefully know about it very soon. Uh, any unauthorized roadworthy motor vehicles and motorcycles that are currently not registered will uh, be allowed to be registered for, within an amnesty period after making a penal payment. And uh, any motor vehicle that has been held up at the Sri Lanka Customs for non-payment of taxes and fines can uh, now be released, of course, upon paying the taxes and fines. So, if uh, I think all's good if you can settle all of that and we'll have more vehicles back on the road. And we'll have to be careful because if you meet with an accident, then there's going to be a charge on that as well. There were some sector-specific licenses uh, that were um, introduced or rather revamped. There will be something called a GST, a, a special license uh, that you can uh, get for special zones for leisure activities. So that is um, more like a license a payment rather than a tax itself. And in the case of the TRC, the license is issued to telecommunication service operators will be done by way of an auction to ensure transparency. So this will also apply to uh, the 5G frequencies to ensure fair play. A few uh, changes to the Finance Act, and I think I uh, personally am very, very happy with uh, the first one, and of course all of it, but uh, the simplification of uh, the process for new business registrations. So currently there are many mutually exclusive processes adopted by the BOI, the EDB, um, the Foreign Exchange uh, department when you need to get your business registrations done. And all of these institutions have different fee structures as well, which are independent of each other. So the act, or rather the budget, says that these complexities will be ironed out and all of this will come into one amendment, uh, or rather into uh, one consolidated process under the Finance Act through an amendment to the act. Uh, in order to uh, make Sri Lanka a naval hub, uh, there will be uh, the facilitation of setting up free ports in Sri Lanka, again, through the Finance Act, of course, to take advantage of our strategic geographical location and uh, the shipping routes connecting East and West Asia. And uh, the closing, uh, this is for all the entrepreneurs and those who uh, hope to set out uh, new business ventures in 2022, the business registration fees will be uh, waived in, uh, in order to create a growth impetus for the entrepreneurs. So that's um, it from uh, the budget highlights. I think we'll be able to take on any questions at the panel discussion. Thank you. So first of all, uh, I should thank uh, CA for 
inviting me for this budget discussion. Uh, what I would do is uh, I will try to answer certain uh, Sarah's questions as well as uh, the reforms, what I see as reforms, where Sarah missed and uh, or we all should know, right? So basically, she mentioned about the uh, revenue side. But what I see in the budget, it's, it's uh, in a way threefold, uh, three aspects have been identified. That is the uh, macro fiscal side, then the external account, both are in deficits, so that is there, and the real economy that is turning this country from this normal trading to elevate it to uh, uh, production economy. Those things are there if you take the budget. So I'm not going to go into details, but I will just mention about the fiscal side uh, because uh, if you take the history, the 72 or 73 years, uh, we had uh, only 1953-54, because of the rubber boom, Korean thing, we had a surplus budget. Throughout, we are having deficits. And, and uh, if you take the numbers, uh, say, uh, even the debt numbers will be in a way, it's a correspondent uh, figure for the deficits. Uh, during uh, the insurgencies in 88-89, the debt stock went above 100, uh, that is GDP to debt. So, so that means the deficit was also double digit. Then came between, say, 98-2004, Again, the debt stock in few years went above 100. And then it came back to say, uh, debt came below 100, and the deficit was around hovering around 6 to 7 percent, 8 percent. And last two years, again, this deficit has gone up to double digits. That is, this year, most likely 11 percent. Out of that 11%, Corona expenditure, although some say it's just 0.2%, in the parliament I have heard that's 02 but it's about 1.5% of the GDP. So, so that is the amount that the government has invested in this Corona pandemic to curtail that, to bring the country to normalcy. So, so, so the debt stock will also be, again, corresponding to this, it will go up to about 101, 102. And the plan is to bring it down uh, to, say, by 2024, the deficit to around 4.8 to 5 percent. That means the debt stock to about 7, 75, 80 level. And then move on by 2027 to bring this to uh, uh, some sanity, <laughs> that means uh, at a uh, break-even level. So that's the target. So the debt stock will automatically go down. When, you, when I say debt stock, again, I am worried not because of this hundred. I am worried about the foreign exposure. So as I don't know, Dr. Mr. Cabral mentioned this, say from 2018, to 2019, within 15 months, we went to the international markets and borrowed the commercial borrowings that is called international sovereign bonds, 6.9 billion, right? Today, because of those things, we are paying interest, foreign interest, over 1 billion. The interest cost is about 1 billion. So, this, this, is, this is the worrisome factor. So somehow between 2019 or 2000, beginning of 2020 up to now, 
the 15 billion ISBs, we brought it down to 13. We didn't go to the markets, we didn't borrow. So that should be the path, that is, we should somehow reduce this amount. Now, to, now January, beginning 22, you all will be having fun, but I have to pay 500 million <laughs> immediately in January and July, another 1,000. So, so, so that's another 1,500. So the ideal solution should be, without, going, without borrowing again, to pay this, that is, non -debt, true non-debt creating things. So they are, it is mentioned in the budget, it's spell out in the budget, the way forward of those also. In the expenditure side, there are a lot of activities uh, that uh, normally we don't see, right? Honorable Minister has mentioned about expenditure controls, that is, one thing is, uh, quarterly warrant will be given to me. Normally, December, January 1st, I get a, as the secretary, I will get a one-year uh, warrant. That means, for the full calendar year, we can spend. But this time, it will be quarterly. So, uh, the other line ministries, secretaries, accounting officers will get a quarterly vote. So they have to accordingly plan their budget. So, so, so that controls the expenditures. So that's a big, uh, in a way, uh, uh, a positive uh, thing in the budget. Then there's this commitment controls strictly mentioned and also in the, uh, before now this uh, uh, appropriation bill becomes an act, that is before the third reading. Uh, I have to do the uh, amendments, that is to say, next year there would be no supplementary allocation. So within given budget, you have to work. So I have a contingency pool, if something, some contingencies to manage, uh, budget department will have a contingent pool. Apart from that, you just can't go to go and say, put a cabinet paper and say, uh, X amount of money is needed. That is prohibited because there would be a uh, sentence or a para in the, uh, as a committee stage amendment, in the appropriation bill when it's pa if, if, if it's passed on the December 10th. I hope it will pass, but on the December 10th. So that's another big difference from the normal activities. Then also we have, uh, Honorable Minister has men mentioned about uh, SOEs. Now SOEs in the budget, we have uh, transfers, current transfers and capital transfers for the SOEs. That the operational side, uh, I think this, this has been the practice now from when, when the Honorable Minister assumed duties, we are not going to give funds to these uh, entities uh, for operational day-to-day -day activities. As the, as the shareholder, uh, the Treasury will give some for capital, but not for operational support. Now, if, if you name any, any, anything from SLBC to Rupavahini to ITN, every time, now, this, these days it's the excuse is Corona, but <laughs> COVID, but this for the salaries also we were paying from the, uh, from the government. So now uh, we have said no nothing doing. You all have to find your funds, get a loan. That means they have to pull their socks and, and plan, have a business plan and move forward. So that direction has been given already, but it's strengthened in the budget. Then the pension reforms, definitely that will uh, save money to the government uh, because pension gratuity payments, roughly 25 billion with this level of uh, retirees, uh, my pension bill is about 25 billion per annum. So that could be saved. Uh, so, so there are, and then, then the Samurdi. Samurdi also, 
the now if you take the samudhi it's just a consumption based activity going on so we want to strengthen that so so likewise lot of uh, lot of uh, expenditure controls uh, streamline in the expenditures are there just to quickly touch about the uh, the items that uh, uh, this lady mentioned uh, about the uh, i will start from the uh, uh, what uh, surcharge uh, it's more or less i think your table showed that taxable income uh, we can we can decide about the number of payments that uh, when the when the act is done um, and and if you have pay now 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 this is for 2021 the companies must have finalized their numbers so the tax payable is we'll say 100 rupees so can give another 25 rupees right so so then then <laughs> then that's that's the number uh, so uh, then about the vat it's straight, straightforward it's a gasset i can issue that gasset quickly when the budget is passed uh, so it's 15 18 right then uh, about the uh, about the uh, social responsibility thing as i mentioned i think a uh, lot of companies met us and they said charge something i don't know whether they told you all but they said because government has spent a lot we have opened our factories because of the government because government has invested even hasita knows that the private sector people said no no we will pay for the vaccines also right so now the government paid that so give us back something so that is that three, two, uh, not they said three percent actually that's why in the technical note is three <laughs> but we reduce it to 2.5 so so that that is that so there would be margins margin what's that called uh, uh, the, the the whole say for an example distributors this margin uh, uh, small margins so that could be considered that we will consider definitely uh, but all should pay something and uh, support right so that is that so so what else about the goods and services uh, goods and services uh, as uh, i think last budget also we mentioned you mentioned that uh, those items would be there uh, so uh, uh, there could be lesser uh, cigarettes, uh, etc. Uh, the present things will go into that. The, this increase could be absorbed into that. Um, vehicles, of course, you said only excise duty, but we have this uh, luxury tax also presently. So all will combine, but I don't think we can bring vehicles at the moment quickly. Uh, that you will understand. Because all, some say that if they get dollars, uh, why, why should not, why, why not allow that? But uh, that uh, what we see is, uh, it will reflect from somewhere else. Some reduction in some, <laughs> some other things. Uh, the vehicles will, anyway, the money will go out. The money that should come into the country will not happen. That, that I think is happening a little bit now that's this uh, the other sources that they give rupees you know this right so those things have to uh, be stopped i told governor also that he's meeting the ceos tomorrow so so uh, vehicles of course i think because vehicle you can pay in dollars we uh, dollars uh, money but who's going to pay for the fuel you have to then keep give me another twenty five thousand per annum kept in another dedicated account for fuel <laughs> otherwise you can't do <laughs> so so that uh, please please bear up bear with us i think uh, we have to wait for a while until our external accounts uh, are uh, at least in a way uh, better than today so what else that's it i think if you have any other questions i can answer hmm? right Thank you very much, Mr. Artigala, for a frank and forthright uh, sharing of thoughts there and an interesting phrase, wait for a while. Wait for a while. <laughs> so now to the panel. And uh, obviously there will be questions that will be 
asked and uh, some further thoughts will be forthcoming. And Mr. Artigala is going to be part of that panel. And uh, we would like to invite Mr. Sulaiman Nishta, who is the chair of the Faculty of Taxation, and uh, he will be the moderator, and also to occupy the places on stage, I would like to invite the Group Financial Director of Brandix Group, Mr. Hasita Premaratna, Director, Hema's Maritime Cluster, Mr. Mushin Kichilan, then to the Managing Director of Sarketa Holdings, uh, Prasan Hettiarachi, the Managing Director of Aitken Spence Hotels, Mr. Susit Jaya Vikrama, and Sara, who you already have heard, uh, will also be part of the panel. And as I have already said, Mr. Suleiman Nishta, Chairman of the Faculty of Taxation, will be taking matters forward as the moderator. So may we invite those named to please move quickly into position and uh, Mr. Sawil will do his part. Uh, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, this very eminent uh, panel for taking time off their busy schedules and joining us uh, today. Um, we will start uh, the panel discussion with uh, a few questions to uh, Mr. Artigler, firstly. Uh, you did uh, touch upon the uh, tax surcharge. Uh, but there are a few uh, questions surrounding, uh, it, it appears to be obvious that it's on taxable income. That means whatever you've paid for 2021, which are filing the return on this month, uh, that will be your base. Uh, just, sorry? <laughs> so that is the question. <laughs> so most accounts are finished, but some are not yet. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the first question there is, of course, uh, whether there'll be marginal relief uh, so what marginal relief means, if you're 2 billion and 1 rupees, you get caught. If you're 1.999 billion, you don't get caught. So earlier, Mr. Articular, there was this marginal relief under income tax, where, uh, so 25% of 2 billion is, is 500 million. How uh, surcharge Surcharge on income tax, that was on the slabs. So until you get to 2 point, until you get to 500 million, you pay only the increment over 2 billion. So something like that would actually be of ease to those who are on the borderline and not give them a heart attack uh, immediately. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so yeah, I think the marginal, if you give it from uh, 2 to two, 2 and a half billion, I think. So how it works is that you have the uh, anything up to 500 million if your total doesn't amount to 500 million, you pay only the excess over 2 billion. Ah, ah okay. okay. You see, so then it's phased out until you really hit a proper base where you can pay the 500 million. So that relief, I think, a lot would appreciate. Um, and then also the point Sarah raised is that the double count on dividends. So you have a lot of companies that have a holding company. So you'll have a 2 billion hitting here. And now because it's not a final withholding payment, dividend is taxable income, but you'll get hit again. So I think that may be a bit detrimental. Uh, if at all, so if uh, at one point it's paid and the so, other could so be- So you all can, you all can uh, give your the, the uh, request or the, I don't know. Yes, certainly. Uh, certainly. Then we can think about sure. those things, sure. right? We'll have those uh, discussions uh, around it. And uh, also whether it'll apply to- <laughs> of course, it'll be, I think you've identified already 62 companies who are well within. <laughs> so I think at one point, either at one point you can collect it, either at the operational point or the dividend point, either. Yeah. Uh, and also, would exempt businesses, is there an intention to tax? That is a bit of a worry because a lot of IT companies, you have given a concession. The surcharge tax, so they don't pay any tax, so they don't have a tax. Very, I don't know. That's why I said. Uh, all mm. No, no. Correct. Correct. That's why I said don't take this bad thing. Right. Right. So this is on the surcharge tax, uh, Mr. Uh, the twenty-five percent. Yeah. yeah. 
So there, uh, whether exam businesses like IT, those who are in BY exemptions, uh, will they get captured or no? Is that the intention or because you have given them, you identified them for exemption, you don't want to tax them on this also? Yes, yes, because it's currently zero. So there is a technical way to get out if at all it's drafted that way. So just for your policy thinking and whether you've thought about it is the question, right? And the next is uh, some clarity on this 2.5% uh, also. Uh, whether it will be on again all businesses despite exemptions uh, like tourism, exports, uh, there's going to be uncompetitiveness coming in there. Uh, again, IT, is there an intention to be blanket or are you looking at something like NBT? is lost then. So we'll see how we can manage this. Right. Uh, we will have time till this uh, April. Okay. Right. So I know there are um, these uh, margins, when the margins are low, those companies are there, yes. mainly the distributors. Correct. And the fix, if they are good is fixed price, say a cigarette Correct. Correct. guy, that would be a problem. So, so those things we are aware are, are, are about those. So I think uh, NBT, we went through all this pain with yeah, NBT. Yeah, 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 <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, who should be exempt, who should not, yeah, import, that's, all yeah, of that. That's so whether you so that's why I said, around that, that's why I said if it's just uh, uh, for a shorter period, yeah. then uh, exceptions, I don't think it's necessary also. Sure, sure. That's just true. as that's a true. social responsibility thing, that's the sure. whole purpose. So I'll come back to you, uh, Mr. Artigal. I'll just move right. to Hasita for a moment. Um, uh, you know, the budget has, has significant emphasis on increasing manufacturing. They're looking, like Mr. Artigal said, from a trading economy to manufacturing, and thereby to propel exports is, I believe, the thinking. Um, in, in that, uh, although that is the intention specified in the budget, uh, should you, do you think we should focus on what we are good at, like we've excelled in apparel, we've excelled in tea, rubber, coconut, or do you think we should go into some sort of diversification of exports and, you know, territory that we perhaps don't know, but uh, is that broadening base a better strategy or really focusing on, because we need to double exports in the near term if you are going to really get out of this rut, right? No, I think it should be a bit of both. Uh, because you can't rely entirely on what's currently uh, contributing, but you should ensure, not, the, not, the, not because I'm coming from a panel, I'm talking about it, but you should ensure that we look at the areas of growth in the existing uh, contributors, first of all. I'll mm -hmm. take a couple of examples. Uh, if you take a apparel industry, there are uh, different product categories and you can really go up in the value chain and, and look at the product uh, innovation to bring better margins right. and better connectivity with the customer. So that's something I believe uh, we need to further move and we have this uh, R&D uh, based uh, allowance that's being given, 200% allowance being given. I think that uh, it's a still a valid till 2023. I assume that, I hope that it will be extended further as well because that's something that will really bring value addition mm. to the country. So that's the first thing. Uh, so that way we should be able to go further up in the uh, chain, for the, be it the product chain or in the value chain to bring better uh, value addition to the country and be more competitive. So that's uh, from the existing industry's perspective. But that said, the diversification I believe is absolutely important. I think IT pharma have been identified and mm -hmm. that those are areas that clearly can contribute in the next maybe uh, three to five years in a big way, particularly from a growth percentage point of view. Correct. So um, the, the both sides are required. Uh, and uh, one of the other important things I would like to highlight here is that when you are looking at the existing uh, <coughs> change or existing industries, you should also encourage some form of a transformation in these industries, right? Like, like the product uh, transformation can come from this R&D related area. The productivity uh, aspect also has to come to keep ourselves competitive because that's a big issue that uh, the, the industry is facing at the moment, particularly when you're fighting the world. Yeah. Uh, so in that context, uh, automation and some of the other related investments that you're making to bring up the productivity should be encouraged, uh, I mean, whether encouraged or not, we are doing it, uh, <laughs> yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah. But some of those areas, if there is uh, 
better relief, you can invest more. And uh, for the bigger companies, it's there. I mean, at least you can afford it, you can manage it. But for the SMEs, yeah, because we should not forget the role that the SMEs play in this uh, segment, uh, they will struggle to reinvest back money. So for that, some sort of a uh, encouragement, I think, would be ideal. So I think that's where you can really make give a push because always the maybe the top five to ten companies in all industries will have the ability, uh, it will have the balance sheet to fund it and move forward. Right. But the next hundred uh, in the list is what you really need a uh, push and a benefit. So that's what probably we need to talk about a bit more. And that push will be something like what uh, would you imagine? people will go for. No, I think like the 200 percent uh, allowance that's right. being given, a similar type of uh, so uh, be benefit uh, focused yeah. on uh, automation related because right now the definition of that 200 percent allowance comes primarily on the uh, product Research, side yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that we need to uh, look at. But the final point I would like to add is the FTAs, the free trade agreements because uh, this in general whether be it the existing or be it the new. Mm. Uh, we have to have access to the markets and uh, that access is challenged at the moment because our competitive countries all are either having a FTA or negotiating FTA, be it Vietnam, be it Bangladesh, right? They have a lot of markets with access. So I know with uh, uh, India, with China, with uh, even UK, now we need to talk about this uh, FTA with the Brexit. Uh, so if that's being uh, considered positively and driven in a more aggressive form, I saw about a billion rupees have been allocated in that uh, overall context but some, some part of the money that's been pushed put in to make the efforts more uh, significant that will push the exports further because if you want to see that exports doubling yeah. you need to have these uh, duty free access otherwise uh, competitiveness wise it will be very difficult to proceed. Great point. Yeah. Uh, just moving on to another area that uh, we're looking at in the agriculture sector uh, uh, also an area the government has identified in the budget to shift from traditional to more uh, sort of uh, traditional chemical fertilizer to an organic format of agriculture, which uh, is very close to your heart, I'm sure, because uh, that's your whole uh, uh, business. Uh, could you briefly elaborate how organic agriculture has been competitive edge for you uh, personally and how you've um, excelled or used that as a competitive advantage? Um, speaking of the personal journey in terms of how we've used it as a differentiator, uh, it has been a value chain approach, something very similar to the transformation that the apparel industry saw in Sri Lanka. Apparel industry was a contract manufacturer, merely selling cheap labor. Today it has evo evolved to be a preferred sourcing destination for ethically made apparel. Tagline is garments without guilt. So in a nutshell, I think the transformation process entailed vertically integrating into raw material based securing as well as forward integrating into product development and design and being able to offer a complete solution and going beyond that to also be able to offer more than just the product but a story associated with it. Mm. The people who are behind the product, how it is made ethically, how we comply to more than global standards, etc., which has made Sri Lanka today a preferred sourcing destination for ethically made apparel. So similarly, my ins inspiration was also to see whether we can look at a similar value chain approach because competing in the global marketplace with our production conditions in agriculture is challenging. Our economies of scale are very small. Uh, if you look at our neighboring countries, if you look at the rest of Asia, uh, our parcel of land, traditionally, if you look at a smallholder farmer, is about a hectare. Mm. Whereas you talk of thousands of hectares in uh, large-scale production economies. So we looked at creating more than a product, which would have a differentiation from the get-go that will allow us to secure a market which was non-traditional. That was our journey. So that was the reason to go the organic route and to merely, you know, navigate the challenges in competition and to secure a non-traditional marketplace. So that has worked for you, but uh, do you feel it can be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, used as a mass market thing for the country? Has, uh, would you think that same model can be utilized for the whole of... I, in your success? In, I would believe that 
we can contribute. Now, this policy shift is an encouraging thing. Mm. Personally, being in the space, I do not wish to speak for the entire agriculture sector of Sri Lanka right. because organic is very small. But I think it's a very encouraging policy shift. But it is also prudent that we approach it pragmatically. It's a very large shift. Looking at a strategy like that would certainly help position Sri Lanka again as a preferred sourcing destination for the global marketplace for agro product because by default Sri Lanka as a nation would be organic. So there would be a lot of compliances that get automatically ticked off which would make it a destination of choice. Having said that, that strategy needs to be supported. It is hoped that the, the budget is looking at a lot of uh, significant funding that is allocated for this area of organic fertilizer, alternatives in uh, chemical um, pesticides and weedicides, etc. But it needs to be, I think, again, similar. I, I use this example of the apparel industry. Yeah. We need to start making these things locally. We need to attract best-in-class world producers through joint venture partnerships and create an enabling environment that will facilitate the transformation and it's not a quick journey it is certainly imprudent to think that we can do it overnight it probably in my personal opinion is a journey of a five to ten years for us to transition but it's a very encouraging policy shift and we hope that the government would actually back these funding allocations into very stringent, realistic, actionable agendas mm -hmm. that will contribute to this value chain transformation. Mm -hmm. It is important that we have the inputs mm -hmm. and the knowledge, the technology and the state creating that enabling environment will get a lot of players coming in. All they need to do is create that enabling environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, uh, Prasanna. And moving to uh, tourism. So all of these, as you can see, are areas that uh, the budget has identified for growth in terms of uh, to boost our foreign currency earnings. And the next, uh, Susit, moving to you on uh, tourism. Uh, a lot has been done, uh, investment made by the uh, government, 1.5% of GDP to bring the country back uh, to a healthy environment or at least in a position to be able to attract tourism. Um, in, in your view, do you see this as uh, enough? Are we able to really open up uh, uh, and uh, can we meet the tourism targets in perhaps the next 12 months? What more do you see needs to be done uh, in your view? Yeah, I think Nishta... Uh, it's on, I think. Just tap it. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the efforts of the government on the vaccination program in particular needs to be commended. Uh, it's excellent uh, effort by the government and as a result, uh, today we are able to open the doors for tourism and uh, there is uh, very positive sentiments and encouraging uh, uh, demand for the destination. Right. But of course, uh, we need to manage it. The, the, the future, uh, the managing the pandemic needs to be controlled yeah. and uh, one more thing that I think the government uh, unfortunately has not uh, been able to address in the budget is uh, the, the, the tourism sector from 2019 has had difficulty in surviving from starting from the Easter Sunday attack mm. uh, up to uh, the pandemic until we open doors now. Uh, the plants have been idling for almost uh, two years and it's a very capital intensive uh, industry where you need capital infusion or capital expenditure to keep the plant alive and to keep uh, abreast with the international standards. So uh, most of the hotels in the industry are sitting on a mountain of depth mm. and uh, severe liquidity issues and the moratoriums are ending in June. So uh, some sort of lifeline or a debt restructuring is critical for the industry because if we don't do that, uh, the, 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 the product will deteriorate and it will have long-term repercussions in the positioning of the Sri, Lankan, Sri Lanka as a product uh, in the world market. So that's something that we would like to request the government, right. at least in the short term, 
uh, to give us some concession because uh, that's required because the industry is struggling uh, and the progress or the, the, the traffic coming in will be gradual. It will not be, it will not happen overnight. Uh, so it will have, it will be a gradual growth. So we need some support uh, to sustain uh, uh, the cash flows for the next one and a half to two years. Thanks. Just moving on to uh, shipping, um, we have uh, Mushin just, uh, so the budget did cover, uh, you know, taking uh, care of us or taking, making the most of our strategic location uh, from a shipping and aviation industry perspective. Um, it talks about a hub for bunkering, provision of food and crew rotations already happening, but what in your view would help, do you think, to propel this, I mean, make it faster, we need exponential growth. Uh, what more uh, do you think can be uh, suggested? Uh, uh, thank you, Suleiman. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, as an industry, we welcome these proposals presented in the budget to promote Sri Lanka as a hub. Maritime aviation logistics were identified as thrust industries by successive governments, but we failed to promote Sri Lanka as a hub for these sectors. Uh, if you look at uh, bunkering, uh, logis uh, crew logistics. Uh, given our geographical location, we have a natural right to play in this space. We are right in the middle of the busy east-west shipping route. And also there are about 300 ships pass, pass Sri Lanka uh, every day. So that is the potential of uh, the market. Unfortunately, I mean, if a ship wants to take one of these services, they will want to take all of their, they will want to meet all their requirements uh, uh, in one port. It doesn't make sense for the ship to call only to get bunkers or only to do a crew change. So we need to look at this, uh, we call it uh, ancillary services or support services in the maritime domain. We have to uh, look at it as a total solution, not as isolated industries. But if you look at, uh, I mean, we need to uh, uh, there are limitations, uh, I mean, we currently do uh, bunkering services and all other support services, but then there are limitations. For example, uh, we have an infrastructure limitation. If I take the bunkering industry as an example, we have limitation on uh, storage capacity. Uh, so we only store low sulfur fuel, whereas uh, there, are, uh, there is a large amount of vessels which require high sulfur fuel. So uh, we need to develop these infrastructures. One easy solution would be uh, immediately we can implement floating storage uh, facilities uh, opposed to uh, land-based storage. And then we need to be competitive when we are providing these uh, support services. Again, to uh, draw example from bunkering, uh, when you import a ton of uh, fuel oil, uh, we pay close to 12 to 13 dollars as tariff uh, compared to regional ports they pay only 5 to 6 dollars so we need to be competitive and also we need to have a consistent policy policy framework uh, and another area would be uh, we need to bring international standards and technology uh, that will build the confidence of these global shipping lines and regulator also has a major role to play there uh, in, uh, you know, uh, monitoring uh, st uh, of the strict compliance of these uh, standards. Right, right. Thank okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Artigala, you uh, want to respond to this or uh, can I pose? Uh, start, uh, start with the uh, shipping that area. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, clearly in the budget we have mentioned and actually that uh, uh, the, the legal or the statute has been uh, drafted also that is about the free port the finance act uh, there would be a finance act and also uh, the shipping registration ship registration and things uh, uh, there's uh, we want to liberalize that area also so uh, definitely we have to discuss with the uh, the uh, industry also, industry. but port, uh, the free port concept, I think all will accept that uh, being the location, as he mentioned, mm -hmm. the, the, 
the location uh, advantage, we have to uh, uh, somehow get the full or uh, the maximum benefit should be reaped from that. So, because if you take the numbers, the transshipment is about seventy percent. Mm. So, these multi-country consolidation, etc., yeah. could happen. And without, we want to have a because custom should be outside the boundary. You know, right. that's the free port in my language. Right. So, so then these things will work. Okay. So, so we want to have that. So, you're moving towards that. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. Then uh, organic side, agriculture side, I think uh, clearly mentioned in the budget, uh, that's the government policy mm. and uh, we are moving towards that. There may be hiccups in here and there, but sure. that's the goal that we want to go. Sure. About uh, uh, Hasita's uh, thing, I think uh, uh, the support, de definitely uh, we can't go on. Uh, depending on uh, 1,200 million T, right, and apparel. So it's a pro uh, product diversification has to happen. A uh, lot of uh, space available. Uh, so there are uh, research and development, as I totally agree. You sh need research and uh, development, so they are the definitely we will give the support. And about the FTAs also, now uh, certain FTAs, in fact, uh, I can remember in 2014, October, we were discussing about the China FTA, right? So uh, after that, it didn't materialize. Basically, we were asking for not a full, full-scale FTA, a preferential, because it's a, it's, if you take the eastern side, uh, it's a uh, one-way ticket, benefit is for them, right? Mm. So we want to have a preferential, uh, 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 so in other words, select some items and get the access there, right. including apparel, things that we have because uh, just 10% capacity, uh, available capacity could be used to increase the volumes, say by 10%, if they can do that, it's 500 million. Yeah. You know, yeah. so <laughs> that those are the numbers. So, mm -hmm. so that uh, I think uh, we will push sure. somehow, uh, especially these key key uh, destinations yes. in the sense key countries. Okay. We have to have this uh, FTA going. So yeah, that's yeah. also one of the uh, key uh, items in our wish list. Okay. Uh, just coming back to this search uh, tax again, uh, Mr. Jasinga. Uh, on 25% um, on taxable income of a past year or the year that has just ended. Um, what are the areas of concern do you think for large corporates and banks uh, that would face from an accounting and assurance perspective? Areas that have come up, um, you know, uh, the period in which we are going to account for it, whether it's a prior thing, uh, what did, you know, where would the adjustment be uh, before uh, PBT, after, uh, how it will affect capital adequacy or uh, liquidity, solvency, uh, kind of issues uh, that are likely to come because the huge amounts that are going to be paid out. Uh, thank you, Suleiman. Uh, so, so there are several questions in that. So hmm. The first one uh, is from an accounting point of view, uh, how this will be, I think, treated uh, from an accounting point. There is a lot of, already within the weekend, there is a lot of uh, lobbying going on uh, to some extent to say that this is uh, should be a prior adjustment considering its 2021 taxes. Uh, the way the proposal has been given today, it, it is to some extent unlikely that it will be a prior adjustment because the, yes, the tax is imposed or calculated on the basis of 2021, but it's a surcharge which is coming in now. So there is no, uh, I would think there is no rationale for you to really go back. Uh, of course, they are drawing parallel to the previous super gains tax. I don't think these are compatible. There was some other different logic for that. Uh, there's a different rationale for this. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that was ill got money so this is not <laughs> that was the foundation of it so I, i would think uh, it should be in the current year uh, i i saw today's papers uh, some people have also raised this issue about we have already paid dividends how can you go and charge it behind yeah you i don't think you need to charge it behind so last year taxes dividends all done and dusted so it's going to be having an impact on this year's uh, taxes as it stands now so i don't know what will happen in the drafting or whatever it is but as it stands now it should be this year so that creates the next issue i think you uh, raised about uh, for banks the capital and capital adequacy yes it will have an impact on uh, capital adequacy because your profitability will to that, that extent will reduce uh, as you know in banks what you can lend is restricted to the amount of capital that you have or in another words the amount what you lend you have to keep it in capital and capital can come in two forms one is the automatic accumulation of your retained earnings and the other one is of course you bring money from outside hmm. so to that one there will be some impact no doubt uh, but i think uh, i don't know the <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> i think as a second treasurer is there that the <laughs> bank numbers are showing very good healthy <laughs> numbers so <laughs> so it's <laughs> so they say it can absorb so so that and also i think is important to bear in mind it's a one off tax so it's not a continuing thing yeah. uh, so I, i don't know it's it's a matter of taking the bump and then moving on yeah. uh, uh, so th- those are the two the other one is of course uh, i think you didn't mention it's it's about where you charge this tax that mm. has an impact on vat uh, on uh, fs so since this will be charged as a tax it will not be deductible for vat on fs uh, so there will be some no relief there can double that count, yeah. <laughs> not double count but no relief <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah. so that's how it is standing today yeah. uh, i i don't know where the time it drops yeah, it depends on change, how it will get dropped but as yeah. it stands today those will be the impacts directly sure so don't send anything and spoil our <laughs> 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 there will be a lot of discussions i think uh, mr adigal <laughs> with us Uh, right. This is just moving on to uh, Sara. Uh, um, Sara, on the special GST to be implemented from yeah. January. That's just a month away. Yeah. Mr. Artigala says the bill is all ready uh, to go. Yes. Uh, so they've identified five areas, and if VAT also is going to get clubbed into that, uh, then you're going to have a exemption of VAT for these Those other industries. Uh, yeah. industries. uh what sort of implications do you think that will have on them uh, would the tax overall go up because of input not being yes. uh, came over perhaps or should there be a um, just your views on the impact on the whole uh, personally uh, sulaiman uh, vat is a cascading tax special gst we are yet to see what it will look like whether it's something that can be uh, that will be passed on and even if it is the you new know, imports or your inputs should also be liable to sgst for you to be able to claim it as an input Correct. so it's not exactly uh, similar to vat right. and uh, if uh, that is the case then obviously the price of those uh, commodities or those uh, relevant right. services will go up because of the lack of uh, the ability to absorb the input mm. on that so likely to have a bit of a cascading effect i yes. would imagine uh because those charging the special goods and services tax also mr article like uh, telco charging uh, a manufacturer the telecom uh, fee is now going to have a special goods and services tax which i can't claim anymore uh so not only the uh, person who's imposed with special goods and services will have his input disallowed plus even he charges other businesses they also can't claim so whether there's a double impact whether that has been uh, considered is uh, something uh, we'll have to probably look at also this uh, this uh, composite tax is nothing new hmm. even in uh, 2012 13 14 time uh, for certain items we had this and now also we have the special commodity levy which is just one tax hmm. so uh, uh, certain uh, commodity now we can't have just one rate in this special yes. rate as now say vat tv say 8% or 15% but in this particular tax i don't think we can have one rate mm. so depending on the commodity Correct. right so that would be certain things could be adjustable mm. accordingly right. 
so that so, and and it's it's I said mentioned it's no, nothing new. So mm -hmm. so there would be certain uh, cost cost uh, imp impact on the cost mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, if you can't claim, then they will add that to the uh, price. Yes. yes. And and uh, mostly these are seen and leisure also you can call it seen. So yeah, leisure, <laughs> where will it get caught? Uh, eh? Leisure wasn't mentioned last <laughs> time. <laughs> where will it get caught? Uh, you mean uh, right. on the uh, betting and gaming, is it? Yeah, it can. Right. 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 Understood. So we'll have to wait to see how that bill comes out. Uh, right. <laughs> so just moving on to uh, SMEs again, uh, Prasanna. I think um, uh, one of the major challenges. Uh, SMEs do have is uh, financing. We've been fortunate, I think, uh, to have this moratorium going. I don't know how many SMEs can actually qualify for it, but if you did qualify, I think it has been uh, uh, quite a relief uh, so far. Uh, and also the proposal to make Samurdi banks a one-stop shop for uh, SMEs uh, to raise finance. What do you think? Um, you know, as this challenge of raising uh, capital or uh, raising loans with banks, what should this scheme actually entail in order to make sure we can propel uh, a new SME regime in Sri Lanka where you have more SMEs, more people getting into it and it growing to maybe mid-level? Um, as you said, I think it is important to commend the government in a very, very diff challenging environment. Uh, especially more so for uh, our context, to have managed to create instruments that supported uh, small, medium, large entities through moratoriums, through various instruments that helped, which given the circumstances, I think it is imperative that we also need to appreciate that it is not easy yeah. to do so. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it has been continued to be done and it has extended, So, which I think is a good thing. Traditionally, SMEs uh, have a very significant challenge in accessing finance. Uh, mostly the opportunity for them available is debt finance. Okay. But with debt finance, the conditions are such there is imperative requirements of collateral, mm -hmm. there is personal guarantees, etc., which yeah. restrict and disincentivize entrepreneurship. I personally believe uh, there is not a level playing field in this sector where there are some of the larger businesses are able to access finance, debt finance without some of those conditions. Uh, interest rates are also very different to the SMEs as well as to obviously it is understood that the SMEs being smaller, there's a higher risk and there yes. need to be a different uh, level of interest. But I think what the SME sector would like to see through this one-stop shop would be a process which simplifies them accessing it mm. and also a mechanism. I, I personally feel the state, there is a lot of funding going in to support the SME access to finance would be to create perhaps an instrument or a body that will allow vetting of projects, ideas based on the bankability, the viability of them. Perhaps I'm just speaking, inventing as I speak, perhaps CA together with the Bankers Association of Sri Lanka can get together to create a certification mechanism that will also build capacity. Some of these SMEs, the challenge is they do not understand finance. Yes. They do not understand financial disciplines. So as a result, not only in bad times, in managing growth also sometimes they fail. Yep. And as a result, there is a downturn. Mm -hmm. So perhaps a capacity building mechanism that will help create some sort of certification, which will not necessarily mean that any SME or any entrepreneur with a good idea mm -hmm. is limited because of finance to contribute to the GDP. Uh, I feel this is a start where Sanaza is looking at a one-stop shop. Hopefully this will cascade to simplifying the process and not making it yeah. very, very stringent in terms of uh, disincentivizing entrepreneurship. 
it is important to have the whole development bank idea which was started i think with ndbd fcc today yes. has evolved to be a commercial banks uh, and the even some of the funding that channels gets channeled through dfis specifically mm. for certain channels like w women mm. being supported uh, for women entrepreneurs certain green initiatives etc um, do not cascade down yeah. because of not meeting the criteria of certain things that the banks would like to uh, secure their risks with. Right. So it is hoped that maybe there is some prescriptive element also brought into the financing sector mm -hmm. that will catalyze mm -hmm. the SMEs and the entrepreneurship. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah, please. So, sorry, uh, just, just to uh, hit this one issue that you raised about CA Sri Lanka. Actually, we have already started that. Uh, where we are working in partnership with uh, Sanasa as well as now I think with People's Bank, where uh, the CAs together with the bank work with the SMEs to provide the necessary… My ignorance, Manil. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> no, we, we started, only thing it has got a bit slowed down because, you know, we had to go to the regions, we can't just stay in the centre and do this. So, we went to Gaul, we have gone to Kandy, we have started in Colombo. I think this week we are hoping to go to Jaffna. Right. So, so we, we are slowly but surely getting there. <laughs> Kudos to you. <laughs> the SME sector needs that. Yeah, definitely. Yes, very, definitely. Very, very much. Definitely. So, this uh, Samurdi Bank also, actually that was one of our proposals, Mr. Artigal, to have a, a special SME bank uh, from the institute, the proposals that we made. So, this has come through. Uh, so, I hope the Samurdi Bank also, like uh, Prasanna did mention, has that framework that is uh, robust enough uh, to Collateral problem yes. for the SMEs. Yes. I think if you can remember, we wa we started something, but it didn't materialize. In the sense, we started with big banks. Mm. We want to have a special SME unit. I can remember we going and opening in Kurunagal also. Uh -huh. But moving forward, they became a part of that main branch. Right. You know, yeah. that 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 culture is not there. So it yes. should be yes. a totally different. Uh, in a way, That's right. uh, otherwise mindset. Yeah. So, yeah. from our side, we are going to have this uh, SME credit guarantee scheme. Mm. Uh, it's been worked out now. Most likely, in the first quarter, we can get this through. Uh, we have got some funding, outside funding also. Okay. So, that would be uh, one answer for this collateral business. But more than the collaterals, I think, uh, this they they have only the entrepreneurship yes, yes they don't know how to keep accounts you know that okay. type of thing so if that support is, is required yeah. that support is necessary yeah. and also we started ndb for development work but as you mentioned now they have become commercial mm -hmm. so another uh, space available for a development bank mm -hmm. so that's also we we mentioned this last budget also right right uh, but because due to these different different issues, we couldn't move forward. But some sizable amount of capital has to be put from government, I think, yes, there, yes. and start this. But so there's that a lot is of a potential from multilateral agencies also for this specifically, right. yeah, like you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you so can just start the, it off. That's a, there, there is a vacuum now or space there yeah. available. Yeah for a development bank because our development banks have now have become changed. commercial banks, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. And it should be SME development, if <laughs> yeah, at all. Yeah, so that, that's you know, right. it's yeah. a small yeah. and medium. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. So, not for the, b not big… Uh, not big projects and stuff. Yeah. That uh, we have to do. That's a space okay. available. Not space in the sense we have to do that. Yes, there's a vacuum there, no? Yeah. Uh, Hasida, just moving on to you uh, on this uh, large and medium scale exporters, the impact of this uh, tax surcharge and the social uh, security Hasita, Hasita. Hasita, Hasita, yes. They are ready to pay. <laughs> 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 no, uh, ready to pay, but how will that impact, you know, capacity building because we are looking at… <laughs> Don't ask the question also. <laughs> uh, 
the effect of uh, you know capacity building yeah. because if you're looking at a doubling exports in two or three years yeah uh, so you're going to be stifled to some extent there and then also the surcharge of two and a half i don't know whether it's going to be impact uh, coming to exporters or whether it's going to be exempt i don't know but if it does then in terms of competitiveness uh, how would you sort of manage that I think surcharge is applicable anyway, right? So there is no room there. The surcharge, but the, yeah. uh, the social security, 2.5% of turnover. No, I think uh, if you take a step back, uh, in 2019, um, the tax rates were brought down. Yes. And when generally a tax, lower tax rate regime is uh, brought in, mm. the expectation is the economic activity to pick up and compensate uh, that uh, reduction in uh, revenue if, uh, through the tax rate reduction Correct. by way of uh, growth, Correct. right? Growth Correct. and economic activity. Right. So COVID came in and it didn't help that cause at all. Mm. It in mm. fact uh, took it on the other way around. So mm. naturally, from a government's pers perspective, you know that I'm saying because <laughs> Secretary of the Treasury is next to me, but <laughs> from a government's perspective, I think um, that expectation didn't come. So they ha there is a reason need to obviously compensate that and have a different mechanism. So that I think expect, uh, explaining it in that form to the investors and making people understand might be um, right. possible, right? Possible. But that said, I want to highlight two things. One is uh, uh, the profits that were earned during that period. If, uh, maybe you would have earned two billion, but uh, it's it's during a very difficult time mm. uh, that it came out, uh, and uh, some of those fun months money has already gone, or if not, will be going towards the reinvestment into some of the other changes and transformations that are happening. So, so that's one angle that probably the uh, be it large or small, uh, the, the, that impact will be uh, faced. But that's, as I said before, is understood. Yeah. Uh, but more importantly, the second point is that uh, uh, 2023, right, which mm. is not far away. Mm. Uh, now, by that time, will the economic activity pick up uh, to contain, continue this low tax regime? Because the direction has been given that the low, low tax rate regime will continue. So that was a policy and that will continue mm. despite the difficult times mm. and, and it has been compensated with a one-off, right? So that's, that's why I said it can be explained. But that said, uh, will the economic activity pick up in 2023 to support that and can the policy framework of low tax regime can continue is the question that we need to think mm. uh, because you can't have another one-off. <laughs> yeah, okay. That will hurt the uh, is significant investor right? confidence. Yeah. This one-off, I think we can you explain can and manage, but but certainly the next one-off, if you if have to make, that will be a problem. So that's why I think from a policy perspective need to be yeah. thought through very carefully mm. whether this so-called activity boost will come by 2023, which is not sure. even 15 months away, sure. which is what we want. Naturally, sure. we, we are all optimistic and we, we all want to make it happen. Right. But I'm not going to be pessimistic, but I'm also trying to be realistic. So, so that's something we need to really think through mm -hmm. because the next one, if you uh, to bring another one off, it'll have an impact. Major impact. Okay. okay, thanks uh, for that, Hasta. Uh, just moving on to Susit again. Uh, the same question, Susit. Um, the uh, tourism sector, whilst will not be impacted by the surcharge, for obvious reasons where you don't have uh, the type of profits that some other sectors made. The 2.5% uh, is likely to affect you. However, um, I mean, you would be able to, uh, or you may have to collect that from the tourist itself. Uh, how would that, you know, in an in a industry that's just recovering, not only here but globally, uh, the 2.5% being added, is that something uh, that will help us as a destination? Is it something that can be justified, uh, do you think? Uh, yeah, so uh, the 2.5%, as Mr. Articula said, it's a short-term thing. And obviously, uh, it will not have a long-term impact on the industry. But uh, the issue would be the, the liquidity mm. of the industry in the short term. Mm. So the timing is really not helpful uh, for the industry because it's struggling to uh, revive Cover, yes. and uh, sustain itself mm -hmm. with the accumulated losses and the capital expenditure that is required to mm -hmm. uh, position the product. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely going to be a challenge for the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, previously, uh, the industry was classified as a priority sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, even with NBT, mm -hmm. it was exempted. Right. Uh, so I only hope uh, that will be considered favorably right. and uh, consider the liquidity crisis the industry is faced with right now and give some kind of concession uh, in the short term. Sure, sure. 
Uh, moving over to uh, Mushin on this, we did uh, hear about the free port. Uh, any any thoughts on what a free port uh, means? Uh, you know, other countries uh, that you can draw on uh, where it has been real success, uh, and whether we can suggest uh, anything because the bill is, I think, being drafted at the moment, um, and how we can utilize our location uh, to make yeah. the most of it. Thanks, Lima. So, as uh, Mr. Articler said, uh, Freeport is a designated area where you are not bound by custom law, import law, finance act. There are certain right. regulations you are not bound by, and this zone is specifically targeted at export-oriented uh, services. Mm. Uh, so, uh, I mean. Uh, in 2013, we declared uh, Port of Colombo and Port of Hambantota as free ports. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't attract that global supply chains or global industries to come and set up in Sri Lanka. For this, only the location will location is an advantage, but only the location will not help us. Mm -hmm. So, if you look at a look at Port of Colombo, uh, we were trying to promote entrepreneur trade. Uh, but uh, on this budget, uh, uh, the Honorable Finance Minister mentioned that uh, Port of Colombo will be developed as an entrepreneur hub. But uh, if you look at the current status, the infrastructure we have is not up to the international standards to carry out these operations. Uh, again, we need also uh, the we need to develop our human capital. Uh, our labor needs to be efficient and upscale to cater to these requirements and uh, manage these operations. And uh, also we need to be on par with uh, competition if you look at uh, the closest uh, free port uh, op operate, well operate in our port of uh, Singapore, Singapore and uh, on to the west we have uh, Dubai. Mm. So. Uh, we need to be competitive in our tariffs uh, and all other regulatory framework also should be set up. Uh, on those notes, uh, it was also uh, proposed that uh, on trade facilitation, uh, single window system and uh, reviewing and updating the HS codes, so those are welcomed and those will ac actually help to promote uh, these free port services. But uh, uh, the benefits for the country is much large if we, yeah, I mean, uh, the much needed foreign direct investments will come. They will, uh, it will create a lot of uh, job opportunities. So we need to work together to get this off the ground. From 2013, we couldn't uh, really uh, get traction on this free port concept. So that requires a lot of investment, is it, from government to? Uh, I mean, it requires in investment to put up this infrastructure in par with global standards, but I don't think only the government has to do it. I think we can go into a public-private partnership. There are uh, private com uh, companies who are ready to partner with the government and uh, invest on this infrastructure to grow the uh, industry. Mr. Sure. Article, uh, I think there was something on PPPs in the budget also in terms of uh, key investments. So this also, I think uh, uh, clearly mentioned about these uh, uh, underutilized and uh, you know assets. Yeah. Uh, whole heap of assets are just lying there. There, uh, if you just one example is the railways. You know, so we can we can have these PPPs uh, going with those mm. uh, as use those assets also because government has. Government can give this as, as government right. participation, you yes. know. Yes, sir. So that type of activities are encouraged because SOEs uh, has to uh, stand alone in the sense uh, they have to come up with their yeah. uh, improvements in the uh, balance sheets, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think we are just running out of time. We'll probably take the last question uh, to you, uh, Prasanna. Um, I think the, there is a thrust towards this foreign currency earnings um, and uh, you know propelling exports uh, agriculture what what do you think we need to do as a government to actually boost agricultural exports um, i think you're uh, involved in exports uh, is it uh, how what do you think needs to be invested in immediately to uh, you know probably 
propel in the very short term to get us to an export uh, sort of hub status? Um, I think fundamentally we must broaden our view of agriculture. Agriculture is not only farming. Mm. There's a whole host and a plethora of other activities associated with it. Sri Lanka has the potential, in my opinion, to be the sustainable orchard of Asia. Mm. We are being looking at a maritime hub, we are in a strategic location, we are blessed with geographic conditions, uh, which many other producing countries do not have. Mm. I think personally for me there are three fundamental things that need to be approached. Our whole land policy is detrimental to mass scale production. The parcel of land, the entirety of land in this country, almost I believe over 70% of the land in this country is held by the state. Mm. Though there are people who have been traditionally farming for uh, years and generations, they don't have ownership of the land. Mm. So there is a program from the government to give them title deeds and there's a process. I believe that we need to expedite that that will create a sizable land parcel and the second fundamental is this state approach of looking at individual farmer empowerment needs to change. Okay. There is a focus of, I think our focus must be productivity not political expediency. We've been looking at each farmer being supported, farmer being given subsidy, farmer being given uh, incentive. We need to look at a productive whole where see, once a region is looked at as a collective which is say of 5,000 hectares or so many farmers put together, it becomes a production zone and then the state can partially invest and create an enabling environment to develop associated value chain infrastructure. So the point I first made is that everything is not about farming. There are input provisions that are needed. There is technology support that is needed. And data is everything. In this technology driven world, we need data in terms of what products, what demand, what is growing well, what regions, soil profiles, all of that needs to be brought to a cohesive platform that will energize and catalyze production. So again, not approaching each individual farmer where there is mm -hmm. perhaps uh, more of a uh, social agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes, farmers need to be supported. The budget clearly says there is going to be a, a lot of support. I think that is laudable. Mm -hmm. But it would be much more sustainable if we look at it where we create a model of economic enterprise that is based on a value chain cold storage, transportation, logistics. So these centralized in production regions where not only the government needs to invest, if they create an enabling environment, there will be many private sector players also coming in there mm -hmm. to create those other associated ancillary aspects of the value chain that will really catalyze. So other things that perhaps which will help us as a nation take advantage of the global marketplaces in terms of logistics creating. Now if you look at other nations, there's a lot of subsidy and various other support given for uh, uh, logistics. Air freight, for example, today mm -hmm. is crippling the fresh produce industry. Right. It's tripled. Mm -hmm. But there are countries that are supporting just to hold on to this weight, not to lose market share, supporting right. the air freight costs. So again, value addition is the core that we need to look at. We are supporting farmers for raw material. There must be ancillary support encouragement given that will help more value added product coming out of the agriculture value chain, mm. which immediately takes us to a different level, different playing field where extension of shelf life with agro commodity shelf life is a critical issue. Mm shorter shelf life with food products, etc. Mm -hmm. But the more value addition is encouraged, these challenges also get narrowed down. Yeah. So I feel we have great potential. Mm -hmm. 
I feel the approach taken to support an agro-based economy as well, a production economy. There is heavy emphasis in the budget about a production e mm. economy. Mm. Mm. I hope it translates into the agriculture value chain also. We need to look at the agriculture value chain from a production mindset. Mm. Productivity mindset, not the traditional loincloth and mammoty where farmers are... We have traditional folklore which says our farmers are fit to be kings if the mud is washed off them. Mm. We cannot rest on our laurels. We need to move with technology. We need to encourage contemporary processes into this sector. Mm. Agriculture knowledge, agriculture education, all of these need to be brought in to empower an agricultural resurgence which is quite possible in this country. Okay, great. That's a, a, a great synopsis of... Uh, uh, the last part of our uh, discussion. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of you, each and every one of you for being here. It is much appreciated uh, for your preparation time and uh, to be here to grace this uh, occasion. Uh, Arun, uh, over to you. Yes, therein. So we conclude with some remarks uh, offered by the Vice President, Mr. Sanjay Bandara. And uh, you might just hang on a while well, he does <laughs> the honours, and then the event will be concluded. So here's Mr. Sanjay Bandara for the final word. Uh, Mr. Manil Jayasinghe, President of uh, CS Sri Lanka. Uh, Mr. S. R. Artigala, Secretary to the Treasury. Mr. Suleiman Nista, Chairman of the Tax Faculty, and members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, as we have come to the conclusion of uh, our annual budget seminar, it is my privilege to deliver the vote of thank on behalf of CS Sri Lanka. A strong economy is very important for growth and sustenance of any economy or any country. As professionals, I strongly believe that we should help the government in achieving growth goals of our country. During the last two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has had significant negative impact on our economy. Therefore, as responsible citizens, I think we should work together to revive our economy. And we should ensure that our economy is back on the track despite all these challenges. So during this evening, we we'll listen to some of the important speeches and the presentations by very senior officers of the government and business leaders where different perspectives of our budget, which was presented into the parliament on last Friday, were discussed. And I believe that what was discussed today in this evening uh, so will be very useful for you all to understand the budget 2022 in the right context. So with a small note, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to extend my sincere appreciation to our guest speakers and panel members you know, uh, for the support extended to us in making this uh, annual tax seminar a success. On behalf of CS Sri Lanka, I extend my sincere appreciation to our keynote speaker, Mr. Ajit Nivad Kapral, Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, and Mr. Isa Ratigala, Secretary of the Treasury for accepting our invitation and gracing this occasion despite their busy schedules. Thank you, Mr. Artigale. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cabral. And this evening, we saw a cross-section of business leaders from multiple industries sharing their views during the panel discussion. So my appreciation goes out to Mr. Hasita Premaratna, Group Finance Director of Brandix Group, Mr. Mushin Kichilan, Director of FEMA's Maritime Cluster. Mr. Prasan Ettyarachi, Managing Director of Saraket Holdings. And Mr. Susit Jayavirkrama, Managing Director of Aikal Spence Hotels. And Mr. Manil Jayasinghe, President of CS Sri Lanka, for sharing their valuable thoughts with us. Thank you for each and every one of you sharing your valuable thoughts with us. And I would also like to thank Mr. Sahar Afka, partner of BDO Partners, for delivering uh, the budget highlights at today's forum. Thank you, Afra. So my gratitude also goes out to uh, President of CS Sri Lanka, Mr. Manil Jayasinghe, and members of the Council for the continuous guidance given to us in making this event a success. 
So I would also like to extend my sincere appreciation to Mrs. Suleyma Nista, Chairman of the Tax Faculty, and all members of the Tax Faculty for organizing this very important uh, tax seminar. So last but not least, so I would like to extend my appreciation to our CEO, Ms. Dulani Fernando, and all staff of CS Sri Lanka for support extended in organizing this event. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you found today's budget seminar is insightful. Thank you very much.